Dear students, today we are talking about dentine. We find dentine underneath the enamel and it differs from enamel in essential aspects. Unlike enamel, it can be formed throughout life. It has a different internal structure, a different mechanism of matrix mineralization, it contains collagen and it therefore is also elastic to a certain extent. Dentine is different from enamel. Unlike enamel, it can be formed lifelong. It has a different internal structure, a different mechanism of matrix mineralization, it contains collagen and is therefore also elastic to a certain extent. As topics, or if you like as learning objectives, we want to contribute to the understanding of the origin and formation of dentine and the structure of dentine we want to go into the formation of the shape of dentin, the arrangement of the dentine tubules, other structural features of dentin, and also the processes involved in matrix mineralization, which take place differently from the formation of tooth enamel. And there is a clinical evidence, especially on the pain conduction in dentin, which is related to the special structure. And dentin can be formed for life, quite differently from what we have seen with enamel. This is also related to its ability to regenerate. Regarding dentin, there are a lot of good textbooks and ultimately you can find all the content I address in this lecture. Of course, all of the pictures and words in my textbook Oral Structure and Biology, which is why I always include the page numbers in the top left-hand corner. To begin with, an overview, something about the topography of dentin. So, dentin is normally completely covered by enamel in humans. The incisal edges and the cusps of canines and molars can also be found in the dentin. Here in this section, the pulp cavity is empty. Naturally, the pulp is inside. The subject of pulp is dealt with in a special, separate lecture. The entire dentine has surrounds the pulp is called circumpalpal dentine. But we need to say a few more things about nomenclature. For your orientation, in this scheme the tooth is shown here sectioned vertically, with the enamel at the top and the pulp cavity in the center, here completely empty. Around it there is this dentine and there are several different dentine regions which also differ from each other in terms of their location, structure and conditions of formation. First of all, there is the circumpalpal dentine, which is the umbrella term for everything. And then a distinction is made between primary dentine and secondary dentine. Primary dentine is all the dentine that was formed before the tooth erupted into the oral cavity. I have shown it in uh, gray here. And pink is the secondary dentine, which is formed after the tooth has erupted, which means the last quarter of the root is only formed after the tooth has erupted. However, dentine continues to be deposited on the wall of the pulp cavity after tooth eruption also, which is why you can see the thin pink strip also here. This is also secondary dentine. And there is also what is known as tertiary dentine, which only forms in response to special stimuli. For example, if the patient has caries or if the dentist has performed a specific treatment. And therefore tertiary dentine is also referred to as reactive dentine or reparative dentine. And the difference between secondary dentine and tertiary dentine is that secondary dentine is formed quite regularly by the odontoblasts and that are continuously present. And tertiary dentine, however, is formed by the odontoblast-like cells, which 
first differentiate in the peripheral pulpal mesenchyme. It can therefore have a special atypical structure. We will see that what it looks like afterwards at the end of this lecture. And take another close look here at the black conjure, the outermost layer of the dentine. This is the oldest layer of dentine, the one that was formed first at the dentino junction. It is called mantle dentine and is very thin, a maximum of 0.5 millimeters. And the collagen fibers are thicker here than in the rest of the circumpalpal dentine. So there is a structural reason for this distinction. And another very important difference to tooth enamel. Dentine is formed for life. Well, for as long as the pulp of the tooth is alive. In this diagram, let's compare the ameloblasts with the odonoblasts in the top row. At the top, I have shown the cell organelles schematically, but you already know them. So dentine is formed by the odonoblasts, and before they even differentiate into odonoblasts, they divide for the last time and lay down daughter cells in the second row, which are preserved as the subodonoblastic cells and can later mature into cells that can form dentine if required. Well, not so nice dentine, but the tertiary dentine, which is only formed in response to special stimuli, and these cells are then also called odonoblast-like cells. But after all, from this point of view, the odonoblasts are somewhat smarter at the beginning than the ameloblasts, which do not lay down any reserve cells beforehand. Well, you cannot really anthropomorphize here. So the cells are not smart at all. So similar to what the ameloblasts have done, the odonoblasts prepare for the production of a dentine matrix. For this purpose, the organelles required for this multiply in this cytoplasm. So we see a rough endoplasmatic reticulum with its many ribosomes, the small black dots, as a protein synthesis factory. And then the odonoblast therefore also becomes longer. And it forms extensions, not just one, but several. But the one in the middle becomes the longest. The others lag behind in their development. And now the dentine matrix is already being secreted, shown here in red. Now only the central process remains, the others have disappeared. And you can also see that the ameloblast is only now beginning to secrete its matrix, but only after the certain layer of dentine matrix has been formed. And the process is somewhat more complex though. Shortly before this, the ameloblast signal to the um, odontoblast that they are present and they stimulate them to form dentine. However, enamel is only formed once a layer of dentine has been deposited. And this process is called reciprocal induction. And as already mentioned, dentine can be formed for life, whereas enamel cannot. So now we need to say something about the odonoblast process. This is the long cell extension that was already recognizable in the early stages of development, and now it is getting longer and longer. As the dentine is deposited, the odonoblasts migrate from the dentino enamel junction where it starts further and further with the pulp as the dentine layer becomes thicker and thicker. And the end of the odonoblast process, actually it is its beginning, remains at the dentino enamel junction and the odonoblast process becomes longer and longer. So it's always about as long as the dentine is thick. Well, within the dentine, um, they may also take a slightly curved course um, in some regions, so it is even a little bit longer there. In any case, that can be several millimeters. Dentine is formed around the odonoblast processes and thus creating canals in which the odonoblast processes do run. And these canals have a diameter of 0.8 to 2.5 micrometers and are as long as the dentine is thick. Well, they are even a little bit longer than the dentine layer because, as I said, they have a slightly curved course. But the details on this will come a little bit later. It should also be mentioned that the odonoblast process 
have some branches at the uh, dentino enamel junction, which is where they begin, but only there, but not along their course. And accordingly, the little canals at the dentino enamel junction, but only there, are also connected to each other by these branches. And one more thing is important here. Pay close attention to the naming. The odonoblast processes are also called Tomes fibers, but must not be confused with the Tomes process, which is the secretory end of the amyloblast. So Dr. Tomes has immortalized himself in both of the structures. The dentino enamel junction is not smooth, it is wavy. This is due to the fact that dentine is deposited in form of individual small islands, which only fuse together when there are more of them. The undulation of the dentino enamel junction is caused by the undulation of the inner enamel epithelium on the opposite side. It is possible that this undulation is caused by the pressure of the cells located further cervically, which divide here and push everything upwards in the diagram at A and B. In any case, the dentine islands develop in C and D and they become larger in E and F and in diagram G we see how they merge. We can take a closer look at this in this sequence of images. In the histological image A we see a tooth structure of a human fetus from the sixth month. The pulp is labeled P then teen is labeled D and enamel, of course, is labeled E. And in the middle, uh, at image B, this dental primordium has been reconstructed in 3D using computer graphics from many consecutive individual sections of the dental primordium. And for orientation, the bone is labeled B, the pulp is labeled P, then teen is labeled D again, and the enamel is labeled E, and the inner enamel epithelium is labeled I, E, E. And yes, the epithelium for the replacement dental lamina is labeled EDL, and the oral cavity is labeled OC. And on the far right is the most important image. This is actually a superimposition of the histology from A and the 3D reconstruction from B, but clearly enlarged, and you can see what happens during dentine formation. And here you can see the many individual dentine islands at the very edge where the dentine is always formed in the first place. As more dentine is formed, the individual islands of dentine become larger and larger until they come together and fuse together. And here you can see the dentine enamel junction again in detail. On the left is the dentine center of a molar from which we have removed the enamel crown. The preparation is cracked several times because it has to be dry and in the vacuum in the scanning electron microscope, but you can see the individual dentine cusps very clearly. They correspond to the cusps of the thicker enamel layer. And what you can also see here is the hammer blowed scalloped appearance, which is the actual expansion of the dentine surface directly under the enamel. In other words, the dentino enamel junction. Now we need to go into a little more detail and the fields labeled A, B, C and D show higher magnification images of the designated areas on the right. We can now see that these typical dents, this scalloped outline which looks so wavy is still very pronounced in A and B, but it becomes less pronounced in C and it is pretty much gone in D. So, a and B are further in the cusp area and C and D are further on the cervical area of the tooth. I always try to understand things like that. How does this wave form come about? First of all, a few explanations from the literature and what else I have heard. First of all, many experts believe that this wave shape serves to improve the bond between enamel and dentine. After all, the teeth have to withstand a high chewing force and if the enamel were not so well bonded to the dentine it would flake off. And sounds good, but it's not true. We only find such a waveform of the dentino enamel junction in humans and only in Macaco's ira, 
these are little monkeys which have um, their space to live in the rocks of Gibraltar. And all other mammals like bears, dogs, horses, which can all exert much greater chewing forces than humans, all of them have really smooth outline of the dentino junction in their teeth. So the technical purpose idea sounds plausible, but it's not true here. And nevertheless, there was once a lot of money for a recent project because uh, space aviation also had problem with the ceramic tiles that are glued to the space shuttles at a heat shield. And they thought they could learn from human teeth how the enamel is attached to the dentine. And in any case, clever researchers had proposed the teeth as a model and received search research funding. And I would rather not say who it was and where and when. So uh, in any case, we know that the teeth must not be a good model for this because the dentino enamel junction is only so wavy in humans and is in this little monkeys and macacus ira but not in all other animals not at bears and whoever but why is it so wavy let us take a closer look at the so-called enamel spindles and we will come back to the question of this undulation afterwards So what are these enamel spindles? Do not be surprised at the name. These names, uh, these terms from, are from the century before last, when everyone probably still knew what a spindle was. Of course, these are not spindles in the technical sense. At most, they might not look at once. Um, well, there are actually odonoblast processes which do reach, for a certain extent, into the enamel layer. And here in the magnification of the dentino enamel junction in this tooth section, you can see this a little more precisely. If we look closer at the enamel spindles now. They themselves are well known about for over a hundred years, and ever since it was possible to look at tooth sections under a light microscope. But we decided to take a closer look using modern methods with all the different microscopes and techniques we had at our disposal. And here you can see what I miss very much today. The intense discussions with my colleagues, the smart chemist Professor Müller and my longtime colleague, the biologist Dr. Herbert Renz. And look closely, there is a Dresden Stollen, so we are in the Advent season. So what do we see in the light microscope? Here in the tooth section, you can already see the many extensions that start from the dentine and extend quite far into the enamel layer. Enlarged here, really impressive how far they extend from the dentine and run into the enamel. If you didn't believe it before, here in the right hand picture, you can see quite clearly that these structures that run into the enamel are extensions from the dentine, really from the odontoblast processes. Let us take another look at what we see using other methods. Here in the digitally processed light microscope with the Cayenne microscope, with the automatic focusing of different planes, we can also see the continuity of the odonoblast process and the enamel spindle. So it's the same thing. We also see this in um, non-contact profilometry, whereby the graphical representation looks a little more convincing to me. However, there are artifacts here. The red line in the green image shows the path of the survey, um, the real profile line here, but the depth of the canyons are optical artifacts. They are created by the translucency of the enamel spindles in the profile image. At least we now know something about the order of magnitude. 10 micrometers, that's about right. And here are also very nice, under the uh, confocal laser scanning microscope, we can virtually focus into the depth as long as light is coming back from the specimen. Here a virtual optical section thickness of one micrometer. This can be summarized as a movie. Looks really nice. You can also see the branches of the odonoblast processes at the bottom left near the dentino enamel junction. Or shown here all together simultaneously. You can already see that the odonoblast processes, when they run in the enamel, which is in the upper parts of the image, 
These are the enameled spindles, which are significantly thicker than the odonoblasts themselves at the bottom of the dentine. And bottom right in the right hand image. And here we have another confocal laser scanning microscopical image, uh, which is now quite colorful. The uh, color code shows the depth in the Z stack, which means the uh, further down, the more blue it is. And here in the scanning electron microscope, you can also see the enamel spindles again. This is a polished ground section sputtered with gold palladium and the dentino enamel junction is cracked open again because the vacuum and the different mechanical properties of uh, enamel and of dentin. We can experiment a little further. Here we have a light microscope image um, and a scanning electron microscopical image of the same section. We can overlay both and although they are two quite different techniques, both images fit very well on top of each other. And the arrow points to the enamel spindles. And this is an etched ground section under the scanning electron microscope. In the left picture you can see the undulation of the dentino enamel junction the dentine at the bottom and the enamel uh, with its nice prism structure because of the etching. Um, and on the right enlarged higher um, picture there are holes like this, such channels in the enamel. I saw something like this 30 years ago under the uh, scanning electron microscope and at that time I didn't even know what it could be. Now it is clear it's the enamel spindles again. They are detached here and that's why there are these channels. If we now summarize everything, then it should have become clear and no doubt should have arisen. Enamel spindles are odonoblast processes that run through the enamel. The question is, of course, how does this come about? So I assume that the matrix of dentine and enamel at the enamel dentine interface is still quite soft at the beginning and that there is still quite a lot of dynamics taking place triggered by the many epithelial cells that divide at the cervical loop of the tooth bell at this stage which can then lead to the inner enamel epithelium wrinkling due to the forces that it generates itself and the matrix then also shows this undulation and these enamel spindles are scattered odonoblast processes that have entered the enamel like loops. This was probably only possible because the enamel matrix is still soft at the beginning. When it hardens, when it mineralizes, they can no longer get out. They are sort of trapped in there and have become these enamel spindles. So they probably get into the enamel, to be precise, into the enamel matrix which is still soft at the beginning, due to the possible turbulences. And there are other findings that seem plausible to me that this is probably true. We also recorded the size and distribution of the enamel spindles at the dentino enamel junction. We classified them by size in serial tooth sections and determined their frequency. The result was that there are particularly many and particularly large enamel spindles at the cusp. And this fits in with the characteristics of the dents in the hammer blow like scallop morphology of the corrugation of the enamel dentine boundary. This is particularly pronounced in the area of the cusps and it is less and less pronounced in the cervical area or even absent. And just like the enamel spindles, and that is why I think it is very obvious that the undulation of the inner enamel epithelium is caused by a push of the cells of the inner enamel epithelium from the cervical loop to the inner cusp tip or the incisal edge in the still young tooth bell, which leads to undulation right there. The older or the more mature the tooth bell becomes, the more hard substance has been formed the more the turbulences come to rest and there is no more turbulence in the cervical regions of the tooth 
which is why there are no enamel spindles and no undulation of the dentino enamel junction. Now let's look at further de details of dentine, now at the dentine tubules. We can see almost everything at once in this fortuitously successful scanning electron microscopical specimen. Here the odonoblast and here in this area there were of course many odonoblasts but they were lost during preparation. But we can see the openings of the dentine tubules as they lie exactly opposite to the odonoblast. On the left in the circle you can see very clearly how the odonoblast processes pull into the canals and in this region in the preparation the fracture runs exactly perpendicular to what we have just seen which is why we can now follow the dentinal tubules lengthwise. And the odonoblast processes are probably torn out as the odonoblasts are also missing here. But here they can still be seen. And in the left picture the predentine is seen from the pulp and the odonoblasts are torn off, but the odonoblast processes are still there, certainly somewhat shrunken because of dehydration as it is a scanning electron micrograph again. But you have to imagine it's somehow like this. The dentine tubules are shown in the middle image, taken lengthwise, and the right hand image shows a cross section and the dentine tubules are also taken transversely. On the far right, however, the lumina are quite small, very narrow. Here, the peritubular dentin has increased considerably. This is also a special feature of dentin. The dentinal tubules become narrower and narrower. A distinction is made between peritubular dentin, here labeled PTD in the pictures, and the intertubular dentin, labeled ITD. The intertubular dentine is the main mass of dentine, but more and more peritubular dentine forms at the inner walls of the tubules. This peritubular dentine is more heavily mineralized, so it is darker in the image here. And here in the transmission electron microscope, it is perhaps even clearer, the lumen of the canals becomes more and more constricted over time as more and more peritubular dentine is deposited on the canal walls from the inside. And this is similar to how old water pipes show more and more uh, lime scale deposits on their inner walls over the course of time. And in old houses with old water pipes, the shower no longer provides such a powerful jet. And here between the tubules, the intertubular dentine again, I said uh, at the very beginning here, uh, this is a structural biological reason. Dentine contains collagen, which is why it is sig significantly more elastic than tooth enamel. And here, in the uh, artificially colored scanning electron micrograph, uh, the odonoblast processes are in turquoise, and in the intertubular dentine you can see the many collagen fibrils in yellow. And the dentine itself, I mean the mineralized parts, have been removed. Otherwise, you wouldn't see the collagen fibers. These collagen fibers are clinically important. The skilled dentist can expose them by etching and then saturate this collagen tangle with fine flowing resin, which is then hardened. And in this way, filling materials can be made to adhere very well uh, to the dentine so that the filling of the tooth is really tight. And one more thing about collagen. Pool balls used to be made from ivory, which is dentine from the tusks of elephants. Because the dentine is so elastic, which is so important for the billiard balls, it is of course interesting why the highly mineralized enamel sits so well on the elastic dentine core and why enamel doesn't constantly flake off when you bite down hard. Well, you can see damage, especially in older individuals. You can already see various flakes of enamel on the neck of the tooth, where it runs out so thinly at the cervical region. No wonder when the tooth bends, enamel bursts out, and the many enamel cracks, especially in older people, are certainly not just only the result of hot and cold effects, but can also be caused by mechanical effects, 
because enamel sits on top of the elastic dentine core. In this diagram I have summarized from bottom to top how dentine is formed. Of course it is mineralized at the end, but first the donoblasts deposit predentine, shown at the bottom of the picture. And this predentine is the dentine matrix. And more details are coming soon. And a distinction is even made between young and old predentine, depending on the collagen and the mineral content. This is the dentine matrix, rich in collagen, rich in protein, and then in even darker pink, the mineralization front with the zone of mineralization is shown. The mineralization globules can be seen here. The, the fact is that the dentine matrix is not actively mineralized by the activity of certain enzymes, as is the case with enamel. But with dentine, the dentine matrix is oversaturated with minerals at a certain time, which initially do not precipitate because they are prevented from doing so by certain collagens. But then suddenly a jump-like mineralization occurs which starts in these globules. And when these globules become larger, the entire dentine matrix is mineralized at once. This happens in this zone of mineralization. And then we have the mineralized circumpalpal dentine at the very top. That's the general term. In fact, this dentine also lies around the dentine tubules, between the dentine tubules, which is why it is also referred to as intertubular dentine. We have already seen this in the electron microscope image. And if you now take a closer look at the dentine tubules, you will see that they have a much smaller lumen at the upper edge of the image than at the bottom, where the odonoblast processes extend into the dentine tubules. The reason for this is the increase in peritubular dentine, that is dentine that lines the inside of the tubules. We have already seen this in the preparations. And this increases towards the top, towards the periphery of the dentine. I have drawn it in in gray in the canal and look closely, you cannot see any of it at the bottom, but more at the top. You can also say that the older the dentine is, the thinner its canals are because the canal lumen is increasingly narrowed by the deposition of peritubular dentine. And so close to the odonoblast in the predentine layer, the canal lumen is still as wide as it was originally, so about 2.5 micrometers. And then further up in the mineralized dentine, the peritubular dentine on the inside of the canals has also increased and therefore the canal diameter has a bit decreased. And in the even older dentine, the dentinal tubules have become even narrower. Here are some more details about the dentine matrix and how it is mineralized. The matrix consists uh, mainly of proteins and has a gelatinous consistency because it contains a lot of collagen uh, type 1 and the trimeric type 1 and type 3, type 5 and type 6. And these collagen types differ chemically in their composition and structure. Type 3 is only found in the dentine that is, firm force, for, that is formed first, that is the very thin mantle dentine. And then there are non-collagenous proteins, in particular proteoglycans, phosphorines, and glycoproteins. And there are also growth factors in there, the well-known and not so specific bone morphogenetic proteins and transforming growth factor beta, so TGF beta, and these are present almost everywhere. But there are also special phosphoproteins in dentine matrix that act on the odonoblast during the formation of repair dentine. And this uh, matrix is produced in the rough endoplasmatic reticulum, temporarily stored in the Golgi apparatus, where it is combined with carbohydrates to form glycoproteins. And from here, they migrate in pre-secretory vesicles, which are called granules because they were just seen under the microscope as these small dots. And then towards the adonoblast process they migrate, where they release their contents through the cell membrane by exocytosis into the extracellular space. 
and the mineralization of dentin now takes place differently than it is the case with enamel. In enamel, there are neither matrix vesicles nor collagen to trigger mineralization. In enamel, it is the case that typical matrix proteins are able to trigger the formation of hydroxyapatite and arrange the crystals. In dentin, there are two ways in which mineralization can occur. It can occur through the matrix vesicles. This is the case with the mantle dentine, where the matrix, which is supersaturated with minerals, suddenly calcifies. Or through the collagen phosphorine complexes, which is the more common way, if you will, of the largest portion of dentine. The uh, freshly secreted dentine matrix cannot be mineralized directly. It must first be converted into a mineralizable matrix. I have to refer you back to the book for details, but there you will read that in the, the, that there is a three-phase process, the individual phases of which are unknown. Hmm. So there is still a lot of research to be done. At least I can still show you in this diagram uh, which path calcium takes, for example. Odonoblasts are well supplied by blood quite unlike the ameloblasts, as we saw in the enamel lecture. And the calcium is taken up by the cell via calcium channels absorbed into uh, transport vesicles and transported to the odonoblast processes, uh, where it is secreted into the dentine matrix. Um, there is no pathway for calcium through the intercellular space in odonoblasts. In an ameloblast, calcium can pass through the cell but it can also pass between the cells into the enamel matrix. In humans, the mineralization of the circumpalpal dentine originates from centers that develop at the mineralization front and grow into small mineralized spheres. These are also known as calcium globules or calcospherids. These globules are the typical feature of the active mineralization front in normal dentine in humans. These globular or mineralization centers grow as a result of the formation of new crystals and the enlargement of the crystals until they fuse together. This process can be clearly seen in the histological image on the left. At the bottom of the picture is the pulp with the typical cell zones, which will be discussed in more detail in the pulp lecture. And then you can see the odonoblast arranged in several layers and the predentin layer they produce, which is the matrix. And this mineralizes starting from these globules and when they become larger the dentine is completely mineralized. And on the right there is a scanning electron microscopical image in which all the organic components have been removed and we are looking from below at the mineralization front in which the globules are fusing together. This spherical structure can be recognized and each individual sphere shows many mostly round openings, the black dots. These are the dentinal tubules. And between the individual globules, however, because they are round, parts of the dentine matrix initially remain free of mineralization. However, these areas are still gradually mineralized. But in a thin section, in polarized light, they can still be seen as typical gussets between the many globules. The zones are called interglobular dentine and in the picture I have indicated the dentine globules which can no longer be seen so clearly with three white circles. Dentine does not grow steadily, which is why the growth lines indicated schematically here can also be seen in the micrograph. Between 2 and 4 micrometers per day, which makes about 20 micrometers every 5 days. And the lines recognizable in this way naturally also have a name. And even here they have two names. There are, they are called Ebner's growth lines or Andresen lines. And there are also Owens contour lines, which have an even greater distance, so that they can be recognized with the naked eye. And you can also recognize a special line, the neonatal line. 
This is not only found in the dental enamel, but also in dentine. And there is something else that is interesting in this context. Here you can see schematically that the dentinal tubules have a curved course. Why is that? The pulp cavity becomes smaller and smaller as the dentine is deposited. And so does the area on which the odontoblasts sit nicely one next to the other. However, as soon as they start to produce dentine, they reduce their own area on which they are sitting. In the cusp area, they have to slide downwards to the root and in doing so, they naturally pull their odonoblast process with them down apically. And in the process, more dentine is formed and so we have this curved shape. And if you then take a closer look at the histological sections, you can also see that the odonoblasts do not sit one next to the other, but rather they are crowded together in several layers below the dentine surface. It is becoming increasingly crowded for them. And they have caused this themselves by producing dentine. Here are a few more numbers about the dentinal tubules. The diameter is between 3.5 and 0.5 micrometers, depending on the age of the patient and the region of the tooth. The diameter is larger near the pulp than at the periphery. We have discussed why this is the case. And the canal density, which is the number of canals per area, we find between 30,000 and 52,000 canals per square millimeter near the pulp. Just to give you an idea of how small it is and how it looks, sort of. There are many more structural peculiarities in dentine, but I would prefer to refer you to the details in the book. Otherwise, this could become far too long and boring here. But I would like to address briefly address a few open questions. We have seen that each odontoblast has its own dentine canal because, after all, its odontoblast process runs from the dentino enamel junction, where everything begins, to the pulp in its canal. However, we have also seen that the pulp cavity becomes dramatically smaller as a result of ongoing dentine formation. And in this context, we have also seen that the odonoblasts are not only arranged in one row, but in several layers. It is said that some odonoblasts even die in this situation. But this raises the question of what effect this has on the course of the dentine tubules. So far, I don't know whether they only move together, connect, or also end blindly. Only in the case of tertiary dentine, which can be very irregular, it is really known that the continuity of the dentine tubules can be interrupted. And what about the odonoblast process in the dentinal tubules? When the peritubular dentine has increased to the point that the tubule is completely obliterated, there will be no space left for the odonoblast process either. It is not clear whether the odonoblast process actually fills up the peripheral end of the tubules. I know of three different assumptions on this point. First, it might be assumed that the odonoblast process filled the dentinal tubule completely and to its full length. And this would mean, however, that metabolic supply would have to be provided to a very thin process extending over several millimeters. For nerve cells, which may have an even longer course in the body, we know this is possible. However, they are accompanied by their Schwann cells, which supply them with nutrition. But here, with the odonoblast process, there are no Schwann cells. A second possibility is that the odonoblast process retracts in the periphery, and the space it leaves free is then filled with peritubular dentine. And third, it may be the case that parts of the peripheral odonoblast process degenerate and are used as a matrix for the mineralizing peritubular dentine. So, if you really want to know exactly, I can only tell you that there are still a lot of research topics to be uh, done and fulfilled on these open questions. Uh, one more thing about the canals, but we do know this. In addition to the normal dentinal tubules, a variable system of giant canals is described for deciduous teeth, but also for permanent teeth. 
They are then 5 to 40 micrometers in diameter and can run through the dentine from the pulp almost up to the dentino enamel junction. Oh, and something else is, that is not uh, so well known. The dentine tubules not only contain the odonoblast process, but also a slightly gel-like slow-flowing liquid that's called the dentinal fluid. The compos composition of this dentinal fluid is difficult to determine because it is only coming to light on the patient when the dentine has been exposed, which is during dental treatment for caries and using rotating instruments, which of course have to be cooled with water. And thus the dentinal fluid is already mixed with this water. And if the cavity floor is then properly dried, you can see with these surgical binocular magnifying glasses how liquid emerges from the ground dentine tubules. This is the dentinal fluid, but because you never drill into a healthy tooth, but only when there is caries or pulpitis, this dentinal fluid is already interspersed with inflammatory exudates like uh, plasma proteins and fibrinogen. So we know that it always contains proteoglycans, tenesin, fibronectin, serum albumin, glycoproteins and transferrin. But the determining of the exact composition is, as I said, difficult and therefore still unknown. And we continue with reflections on experiences that many people may have or may have had, I mean toothache. So I hope that most of you listening to me as students have all had enjoyed such good prophylaxis measures that you have healthy teeth without cavities and without dental fillings. Then hopefully perhaps you don't have toothache either. But there are also many people for whom the dentist has to prepare cavities in their teeth in order to remove caries and prepare the tooth for a filling to preserve the tooth. What may be tolerable in the enamel, but I can tell you it's not pleasant either. It is absolutely unbearable in the dentine. That's why there is always an anesthesia. Before the patient comes to the dentist, however, the tooth may already has been painful. And I would be really happy if I could explain to you how this pain is actually physiologically transmitted. After all, the structural characteristics of dentine provide clues to the mechanism of pain transmission in dentine, but so far not all phenomena can be conclusively explained. This is why the explanations are still referred to as theories. First of all, there is the hydrodynamic theory. The dentinal fluid can contract and expand due to the temperature stimuli. So, hot coffee, cold ice, you may be familiar with this. Osmotic processes can also trigger such effects. If people have deep caries or fillings with leaky edges, I mean, there are still such things available, uh, you will feel a sharp pain in your tooth when you eat a honey bun, for example. Osmosis has then taken place when the sugar in the honey reaches exposed dentine wounds with the dentinal liquid. So, physically, a stamp pressure or suction is then built up in the narrow canal lumen over large distances, which can ultimately be transmitted further via free nerve endings. It's a bit like a hydraulic brake system in a car. You step on the brake pedal and the force is transmitted via a brake booster uh, with the oil in the brake lines to the brake shoes, which are then pressed onto the brake discs. So, however, with regard to the dentine, it is questionably, it's questionable whether this is the only mechanism, as mechanical stimuli can also be perceived in the dentine in very rapid succession. However, the dentinal fluid has more of a gel-like character, and such a gel uh, would not be able to react as quickly. This brings us to the second theory, the direct simulation of free nerve endings, also known as the conduction theory. In other words, some, but not all, dentinal tubules are permeated by efferent free nerve endings. Here, the stimuli can reach the nerve directly. However, this does not explain everything, because in the crown region, only about every second canal contains a nerve, and there are even fewer towards the cervical and apical regions. 
According to most findings, the nerves usually do not run through the full length of the canal, but remain limited to the area close to the pulp. However, dentin is most sensitive peripherally along the dentine enamel junction, and using fresh teeth and their immediate fixation, it was shown that nerve endings can reach right up to the dentine enamel junction so that the direct simulation of free nerve endings alone could explain the pain perception of the dentine but not for all regions. Free nerve endings are probably not to be found everywhere. And thirdly, there is the odonoblast itself as a pain receptor, which would then be the transduction theory. It is also speculated that the odonoblast, especially its process, functions as a transmitter of pain perception and transmits it to downstream nerves. This assumption is supported by the observation that Odonoblast processes and nerve, nerve fibers uh, are connected by gap junctions, but there is no evidence that they actually communicate electrically with each other. So the current status is still that possibly all three mechanisms, as described in these three theories, uh, together they may contribute to the overall perception of pain in dentine. You will certainly have to learn and explain the pathomechanism of caries in the special clinical courses on operative dentistry. In my lecture on structural biology, I would just like to show um, what caries can look like. Here you can see deep dark fissures in this molar tool. When you will become a dentist eventually, you will one day be able to decide whether or not a caries lesion is un hidden underneath such dark fissures. In any case, there is always the question of sealing such fissures beforehand so that no caries invasion can take place. But that's not my area of expertise either. You can now see in the micrograph on the right how the fissure is darkly discolored, probably not only filled with some kind of debris, but probably already infiltrated by caries. And uh, underneath in the dentine, you can see how the caries has spread much further. So caries is a demineralization process of tooth structure, both enamel and dentine. And the culprits are bacteria, mainly Streptococcus mutans. And they find prefabricated tunnel systems in the tubules of the dentine in which they can penetrate further and further. They get their food from what the patient are eating and also from the organic substances they find in the dentine. Dentine is demineralized, thus it becomes softer. And here, in the scanning electron microscope image, these are the two ones on the left at A and B, you can see the dentinal tubules and some rod-shaped bacteria in there. They are labeled with B. The odonoblast process is also still there, labeled with F. And on the far right at C, this is a transmission electron microscopical image. And at D, you can see the dentine but it is no longer as electron dense as it normally would be. It is already quite heavily demineralized and B indicates the bacteria as they spread in the canal lumen. Normally, dentine is continuously formed by the existing odonoblast. However, in response to a certain stimuli, such as caries, therapeutic interventions or uh, as a result of abrasion or attrition and if the pulp is also inflamed as shown here in the left picture with the enlarged blood vessels then reactive dentine is formed which is also referred to as reparative or as tertiary dentine. Do you remember? Secondary dentine was the dentine that was formed after tooth eruption and then primary dentine would be the dentine that is formed before tooth eruption. Uh, I don't know if it is officially, officially called primary dentine or whatsoever. And now this tertiary dentine or reactive or reparative dentine, it can have a very atypical structure. It is not only formed by the regularly present odonoblasts, which differentiated very early on, but also by these odonoblast-like cells. And these are the daughter cells that have quickly divided shortly before the actual differentiation of the odonoblasts 
and they wait as subautonoblastic cells until they are also needed for tertiary dentine formation. And they are probably not as good at it as the autonoblasts. In any case, the structure may well be atypical. And you can already see in the picture that it is formed somewhat hastily. The dentinal tubules can be irregularly arranged, very thin or even completely absent. Sometimes blood vessels can also be walled in, in which case it is called vasodentin. And some, others, some other authors also see a similarity to bone, in which case it is called osteodentin, or completely atubular fibrodentin is being deposited. And finally, a look into a cavity of a tooth. This is the upper first molar on the left, and it has a palatal gold hammer filling, and you can uh, see a pulled up cavity, mesial, occlusal, and distal, and stained with methylene blue, which looks quite red here, and a fracture line running horizontally in the distal buccal dentine cusp is clearly visible. And there was probably a filling in there, but the patient had terrible toothache because the dentine was fractured there. And the swinging cusp had not yet completely broken off, but the crack was probably already deep down to the pulp. And that hurts. I'm showing you this picture so that you can see what you can expect if you decide to become a dentist. And I hope that you will be able to help your patients if you know the basics of structural biology down to the last detail. There are so many more details about dentine, but that would go beyond the scope of this lecture. My advice again is to pour you a cup of tea and read the book at your leisure. I'm sure you will find it worthwhile. Now we come to the take-home message. As you have seen, dentine is another world of its own. We have talked about the development of odonoblasts, which divide and form reserve cells before actually the formation of dentine begins. Dentine can be formed throughout life. And you have recognized that the odonoblast processes are the cause for the formation of the dentine tubules, because the odonoblast processes are attached to the odonoblasts all the way from the dentine enamel junction, where dentine formation begins. And we have discussed the canals and the mineralization of dentine in detail, and also uh, we have seen that the canals become increasingly narrow at the periphery. This is then a sign that dentine is aging. And pain conduction is another interesting topic, not fully clarified in detail, but there are three possible explanations. However, dentine is formed by the pulp throughout life under special circumstances as reactive or reparative dentine, which is also known as tertiary dentine. And when caries occur, the canal system in the dentine is unfortunately an ideal structure for the spread of caries. Hopefully you can prevent this from happening to yourself and to your patients by taking appropriate prophylactic measures. And with this, I thank you for your kind attention.